Um, so welcome everyone. This is another webinar in our series of webinars uh, hosted by the Department of English Language and Literature, Faculty of Arts and Humanities, the British University in Egypt. Uh, we were supposed to have Professor Shadia Fahim, the Dean of the faculty, but she apologizes. Uh, she got caught in another meeting. So today we have a very interesting webinar and our moderator is Dr. Noha Hanafi, who is a lecturer at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, British University in Egypt. She obtained her PhD in uh, 2018 in comparative literature. She was also awarded two grants to study in the Scottish University's International Summer School and got another grant in University of Naples uh, American Studies Conference Summer School. Her research interests include post-colonial studies, environmental humanities, cultural studies, contemporary Arabic fiction, and world literature. So welcome, Dr. Noha, and please, yeah. the floor is yours, um, and introduce Kami to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Huda, and welcome, Kami. It's very nice to have you here. Um, the webinar is entitled, uh, very interestingly, in this Interdisciplinary Trends, Literature and Photography. This is very, very interesting to me. Our guest speaker, Kami Timson Amini, is an assistant leader at the Public Arts, at Public Arts University of Houston System, where she also teaches the history of photography. She received her MA in art history in, um, and both uh, an MBA in both English literature and art history. Mrs. Timson Amini is largely influenced by art historical scholars who interface with postcolonial theory, such as Darcy Grigsby and Linda Nochlin as well as photography and visual uh, culture scholars such as James Ryan and Stuart Hall, who employ post-colonial lens in which to view our contemporary world. Um, I'm going to leave the floor to uh, Kami to start her, our, her presentation, and I can't wait. It's very interesting. I'm very excited. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Hanafi, and congratulations on getting your PhD. Uh, I know that's a that's a big beast of a project, so I'm very uh, in awe of that. Um, yeah, I wanted to just kind of start a little bit by talking about my background in literature because I know that um, I know that you know you guys are the department of uh, literature and comparative literature. Um, so while I will be talking about photography, it is actually literature that I began in, and it is actually literature by way of post-colonial studies that has led me into studying Martin Parr, who I have been studying for two and a half years now. I've been working on this project. Um, yeah, I got my undergrad many, many years ago. In the 1990s, I went to a small women's college. So my undergrad, I could not choose between wh whether I wanted to study art history or whether I wanted to study English literature. And of course, my academic advisor being a true academician said, well, why don't you do both? <laughs> And I said, oh, that had not occurred to me. So I, you know, and this was in a time in the 1990s, pretty much before a lot of this interdisciplinarity was common in, especially in small liberal arts colleges. So um, I didn't really know what I was doing with this kind of hybridity, but I knew that I liked it. So I, was studying art history and studying English literature at the same time, not really recognizing, I mean, I instinctively recognized how the two were connected, but the departments were not connected at all. And the two departments remained, okay, now you're, now you're in the art history box and then you take that hat off and then you go into the English literature box and, Returning to school years later, because I recently got my master's, I was shocked, surprised, and very happy to see that now these sort of disciplinary boxes are not the way that they were in the 1990s. So I come into my art history program recently 
And I said, okay, I know I'm coming in as this intense Anglophile who absolutely loves um, the, the history of British art, but I didn't quite know what I wanted to study. And I knew that I wanted to study the British art, but from a different angle. And I didn't quite know what that angle was yet. And my department of art history gave me the okay. They gave me the green light to go digging into other areas. So I go into the history department. I go into the literature department and I was able to find what I was looking for. I took a class in Orientalism and, you know, that was where everything opened up for me. So once I get into, because as you guys know, Orientalism is all the humanities in one. It's the visual humanities, but it's also, you know, Saeed was largely based, basing his theories in literature. Um, so that Orientalism class really opened up everything for me and the professor of that class ended up being my biggest mentor and her area of study was photography. So we were able to take my interest in photography studies and combine it with post-colonial studies, which not a lot of people do. There's a small subset that works in this area. Um, I'm sure you guys will be familiar with Ariella Azule. And, um, you know, she works in photography, post-colonial studies. And um, yeah, Hoda, you would like, I mean, Azule's new book is coming out. And, um, you know, she's digging into areas of, uh, I think, I think I forgot what the title of it is, but it's, you know, the thinking about areas of borders before borders existed and, um, you know, fascinating stuff. So, yeah, she works in art history as well. So, yeah, once I got into these, this area of realizing that it was okay to study the visual arts along with post-colonial theory and post-colonial literature. That was where I just found this really sweet spot. And I'm, I'm lucky that my department let me do that. This is very fascinating. Um, and I, I do get the point about in the interdisciplinarity not being uh, popular because we had that for even like way after the 1990s until very recently, maybe like in the last 10 years, it's been sort of popular coming to, to like our academia. So uh, I get what you mean. So this is very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. It's becoming more and more common. And, you know, I think that as we move forward, it's gonna increasingly become more common. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I guess for my method today, um, I'm going to I'm going to read a little bit of my paper, and then um, after I read little segments, I'm going to kind of go off script and talk about the slides a little bit because um, one of the best parts about teaching visual arts is that you have these great slides that you're always able to come back to. It helps students engage. Um, it's, 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 that's the great part about teaching the history of photography is that it's very difficult for the class to be boring because you can always um, <laughs> lean back on the slide and say, okay, now let's discuss. So, um, you know, my way of teaching is that I'm always excited for students to jump in at any moment. So, Please, you guys, if you want to jump into the chat box, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you love it, if you hate it, if you have questions, just jump into the chat box and, you know, we can make this a discussion and we can um, you know, talk about it as we're moving along. Obviously, we'll have a Q&A afterward, but please feel free to jump in at any time. 
So I will start here. This is the intro, the, um, the introductory slide, um, kind of before I get into the paper, but so this is Martin Parr, who, as I said, I've been studying for two and a half years, and um, I was able to conduct an interview with Parr. Uh, it was nearly a year ago now, and I was here in Texas. He was in England. We had um, an interesting conversation. Yeah, we can talk about that later. He was not as forthcoming as I was hoping he would be, uh, but he is... He's very clever and he, I think he kind of figured out what I was doing early on and was trying to um, slide around that, you know. Um, he could tell that I had a bit of a critical lens on his critical lens. And he's, uh, he keeps very close to the chest and only, he, he's known for giving many, many interviews and just saying the same thing over and over again. So I was trying to get something new out of him and that was not happening and I was trying to push and he knew I was trying to push. So yeah, we can talk about the interview, the interview later if you want. So that'd be very interesting to know what he said, what he said in the interview. After yeah. we see the slides, it should be interesting to see like his own, um, you know, take on things. So, yeah. So we'll start here with Seven Colonial Still Lives. The British contemporary photographer Martin Parr, in his short photo book, Seven Colonial Still Lives, delivers seven seemingly banal and benign images of remnants of British colonization in Sri Lanka. Traveling through three former colonial cities, Parr photographs small, simple details that invoke a large, complicated history. Through a tasteless bowl of porridge, plastic wrap jam cakes, and a cheap tuxedo, Parr welcomes us to closely inspect the manufactured consequences of British colonial rule. Perhaps more importantly, he, he has offered us an opportunity to view the world through the eyes of a British colonialist, where a still life photograph evokes the surreality and preposterous truths of colonial networks, economies, exchanges, and relationships of power. Hence, through his still lives, Parr has invited us to see colonially, to use a period eye that invokes the simultaneous birth of photography and the height of the British colonial empire. In Parr's earliest color collection, several critics recognized an othering of his own British people. This othering, a commonly used trope of colonial representation was never followed to its origins in British colonization of the 19th century. I am able to connect Parr's imagery to colonial photography using the example of the 19th century commercial photographer, John Thompson. John Thompson traversed Asia amassing a spectacular oeuvre of geographical and ethnographic images in service to the British Empire. He then returned home to London to focus his lens on his own British people with remarkably similar results. Thompson's collection, Street Life in London from 1877, forms a natural comparison with Parr's The Last Resort that establishes a visual legacy with over a hundred years difference that is able to firmly ground Parr as an inheritor and frequent contributor to colonial imagery. So going off script for a little bit, um, I wanted to use this as an introductory slide because, um, you know, Martin Parr likes to deny that he is influenced by 19th century photography that he he likes to deny any sort of othering and um, just sort of likes to claim ignorance. Whereas I believe he knows a lot more. Uh, he's very well versed visually. And I think that he knows exactly what he's doing and he just sort of brushes it off sort of like, um, he uses the old trope of 
the traditional documentarian who says, well, why, you know, he literally says, why shoot the messenger? Don't criticize me. I, I'm just taking pictures. You know, I, this is, I'm, I'm just showing you what I see. Whereas he is far too visually educated to, to honestly think that there is such a thing as the objective photographer. Everyone has their particular lens and their particular ideas and biases. So one of the reasons I, I'm saying that he is very well versed is because this image is from uh, Candy. So Candy is a region of central Sri Lanka and Candy region of Sri Lanka actually before colonization had its own kingdom. So there's actually a kingdom within Sri Lanka before colonization. So you've got this, you know, another preposterous truth of colonization is you have one kingdom replacing another. So here, obviously you have Elizabeth and Philip when they were younger. Uh, this is a tea tray that is clearly in states of decay. And it's just, but it's specifically located in candy. So it's this idea of the, the colonial royalty replacing another royalty. A single small cup of porridge rendered in great detail sits on, sits on a synthetic tablecloth, a quiet study in tones of gray and beige. The title, Nuwara Aliyah, 2004, denotes the former British colonial city in Sri Lanka known locally as Little England. It is a land known for some of the most extraordinary ingredients and cuisines in the world. A stodgy, mushy bowl of porridge is not only perplexingly displaced, it is utterly ridiculous. In order for British porridge to arrive in bed and survive in Sri Lanka, there had to exist elaborate and sophisticated trade routes over land and sea. British ownership of indigenous lands, human labor on at least two continents, unimaginable expenses incurred in transit, servants to transport, cook, serve and clean, private clubs set up by the British to maintain their physical, cultural and culinary separation. All of this in order to deliver into the stomachs of the then British residents, possibly the most boring and tasteless food imaginable. On a closer look, we see the cup is chipped the green paint is wearing, the spoon is scratched, and the tablecloth is wrinkled. All are signs of an empire lost and in decay. In a simple bowl of porridge, Parr points us to the entire life cycle of the British colonial project. From hopeful advances into global territories in the name of enlightenment and economic growth, to the establishment of British rule, along with torturous colonial outpost to extract and produce copious resources, to indigenous nationalisms that reject and rebel for foreign rule and demand individual autonomy to the stubborn and floundering hanging on of the Commonwealth. Through this historically prismatic viewing, Parr allows us to see colonially, to envision history through colonial eyes. While Parr may continue to be tethered to his othering lens in his portraits and seascapes, the still lives work in an area of hope and evolution as they are a reversal not onto the British people, but onto the empire itself with much more successful results. When Parr began work as a professional photographer in the 1970s, Color was primarily absent in British photography. It was black and white film that was traditionally reserved for the reverence of documentary. Subjects that required earnestness and were embedded with historical respect, such as the English working class, 
were solely photographed in weighty black and white. Parr began photography working in black and white, firmly influenced by the work of the British documentary photographers, Tony Ray Jones and Chris Killip. Tony Ray Jones discovered a particular English quirkiness in some seaside towns where the British seemed to flock despite constant inclement weather. His images of the English at leisure by the sea are composed of a delicate humor built upon the recognition of playful national stereotypes that gently balances the sobriety of black and white documentary. Chris Killop used black and white documentary to chronicle the demise of the English post-industrial North. Killop, with his reliance on narrative and poetic touch, was a strong influence on Parr's early work. Killop formed relationships with Northern families struggling with no employment or dignified home life, photographed them and presented the aching collection in flagrante in 1988. Chris Killip recently passed and uh, he was a very close friend with Parr. And um, you can see, this is early Parr, so you can see the influences here with, this is, you know, the idea of the British constantly looking out at the sea. Um, the sea plays such a large role in the cultural consciousness of the British. And so you can see Killip's influence here. Parr's own early black and white work in North Yorkshire and Ireland seems to mimic a lot of traditional documentary, especially that of his influences, as he keenly establishes traditional Britishness as a favored subject. While some of his early black and white images contain the humor he is known for, there is none of his later biting signature critical eye this early in his career. Color photography was early on associated with advertising, capitalism, and the amateur snapshot. All of this was, of course, at the time, antithetical to the seriousness of traditional documentary photography. Early on, Parr was captivated by the American color photography of William Eggleston and Stephen Shore and the inclusion of color photography at MoMA's permanent collection and increasingly frequent exhibitions beginning in the 1950s was a green light for Parr's own experimentation. The color still lives of Eggleston and Shore show the influence both had on Parr's color work. Britain and Europe were severely lagging behind the color revolution that MoMA was supporting However, it was Parr and his generation in the early 1980s that would bring color documentary, documentary photography to Britain. This was a time um, before we culturally understood of taking pictures of your food. <laughs> this is something we do now. Uh, imagine this was in the 19, early 1970s. And the idea behind this is, you know, these are American photographers. And the idea behind this was the, the, you know, the boring, the banal, the quotidian uh, existence of kind of this, this boring American um, suburban sort of uh, mechanization of the everyday. It's very interesting how this actually like sort of evolved into right now with the Instagram culture and like taking photographs of your food as something exciting. People don't, like don't actually like eat anymore. They just take the, the, the perfect picture and then they start eating, you know? So it's kind yeah. of what they're doing here. Yeah, I know. It's fascinating to think that this was 1970s, yeah. you know, and the color is so vibrant yeah. because um, if any of my students are here, they will chime in because I know now um, American color photography took its cues from advertising mm. and, you know, 
Eggleston is probably the earliest successful um, famous photographer working in color. And he took his cues directly from advertising and actually used the same technical processes mm -hmm. as advertising was using. They were highly expensive, but he was adamant to do this because he wanted that vibrant color. Um, it was only available to those working in advertising at the time because color photography was prevalent, but it was that kind of old, it, it's the kind of grainy, highly untechnical color photography that we're used to seeing from the seventies. You know, if you see a color photograph from the seventies, it's grainy and it's, um, it's not, it's, it doesn't have this kind of vivid brightness. So this is what Parr was working in. He was working in this sort of, you know, extremely bright color. Hmm. It is fascinating. So, this, like this is in the 80s and the 70s the colors are brilliant this is fascinating. Yeah. and and this is the reason that it was so bizarre it's hard for us to really understand now because we're accustomed to this kind of color we're accustomed to this kind of photographic technology but you know like i'm always telling my students in class you have to take yourself out of the current context and put yourself in the 19th century, or you have to put yourself in the 1970s or the 80s and say, this was very unusual for the time. So it's kind of hard for us to understand now, but the kind of, actually, I should probably in the future have a comparative slide. I have a few comparative slides coming up, but this was, this was very unusual. This is only the type of imagery that would have been used in advertising. And Parr was trained in advertising. So this is what he's familiar with. The last resort is the photo series from 1986 that delivered Parr his first professional success and real critical attention. Shot in the deteriorating seaside resort of New Brighton, these images depict Margaret Thatcher's reign as harbinger of strict austerity felt primarily in the North, as well as her attempts to force a conservative cultural hegemony. London critics were sharp and did not hold back their ire. It became apparent that the overabundance of semi-nude, tattooed, sticky with food, working class bodies lounging around piles of litter and dirty sand was too much for sophisticated urban viewers to bear. Critics and viewers in London saw the images as blatantly patronizing, reckoning Parr a snobby Southern middle-class voyeur who had moved to the North, calculatingly trained his camera on the working class and breezily passed judgment upon them. This was a massive breaking with documentary tradition. It was seen as a clear lack of respect and empathy. In other words, what critics saw in Parr's images was a transgression of photograph photographic ethics. Some critics saw a contemporary othering in Parr's images, and this othering was primarily one of class. Other photographers of the same period as Parr were also making social documentary work, also in the North, and were producing some of the most exciting color work of their generation. However, overall, Parr's color contemporaries chose a different approach than Parr, one resulting in a warmer reception and gentler critical responses. A contemporary of Parr and an early adopter of color photography is Nick Wathlington. In 1991, he published Living Room, a highly acclaimed photo book of Northern England's working poor. Wathlington had been photographing his friends their neighbors and their children for several years in a Nottingham council estate. These are images not of strangers, but of friends who had given permission to be photographed and understood Wapplington as celebrating their resilience through the Thatcher years. While the images highlight the economic depravity suffered by many in the North, they simultaneously maintain an intimacy, allowing their subjects dignity and have little sense of transgression. 
Um, you can see here, this is more of a traditional documentary um, uh, composition where you know you have this man here looking straight forward. The traditional documentary composition is like straightforward, looking on as you know, we have to remember when you say documentary, you are literally using the word document. It is a document that could be used sort of as, you know, in a court of evidence, right? It's a document. And so this, this shooting straight on, looking straight forward is very um, traditional. And you can, of course, see PAR does not do that. In the early 1980s, Paul Graham, another contemporary of Parr, was commissioned by the Photographer's Gallery in London to photograph his particular vision of Britain in the year 1984. Keenly aware of the social meltdown of the Thatcher years, Graham began photographing the waiting rooms of Northern England's social security offices. He visited hundreds and the ensuing photo book, Beyond Caring, delivers images of a tense silence, seething boredom, and a humble desperation. The unusual choice to photograph in color lends another layer of richness to the sweeping isolation and shame. Graham's images are captured in bold acerbic color, yet with their touches of humor and delight, they retain a humbleness, even a feeling of solidarity. So for Graham, um, who says, you know, in 1984, I'm going to go photograph these social security offices to show the tremendous amount of unemployment that was happening in the North that Thatcher did not seem to care about at all. Um, the obvious choice would have been for him to photograph in black and white, but he chose color because he said these social security offices were very bright with these intense colors, which is a strange choice. And um, yeah, he comes away with these very strange, you know, weird colors, but he's got, you know, the, you've got this boring brown floor and this like sickly green fluorescent. And it it's this stuff that lends this feeling of um, I mean, sickly green and ugly brown, you know, and this little pop of pink right here that shows the vulnerability of this child. Parr, however, was breaking several photographic traditions. Parting with traditional black and white imagery, combining documentary with color, and most disturbingly, he had marked a new designation for himself as a documentary photographer who employs a sarcastic, critical, distant, humorous lens. In the last resort, Parr used the traditional methods of advertising that he was trained in, employing vivid, unnatural colors combined with an outdoor flash, all producing images seen as garish and kitschy, when made for documentary instead of the usual magazines and billboards. At this point, he was no longer imitating his influences and had created a signature style all of his own. One that would inflame the sensibilities of critics and viewers all around. The othering, an element of his visual criticism, was a constant disturbance in these images, one that Parr is reluctant to address and his supporters have been eager to dispute. Parr is certainly not the first British photographer to utilize a patronizing judgmental gaze. Indeed, what led the broad critical outrage upon viewing his imagery was actually an inherited aesthetic lens derived from a long history of photographic practices begun in the 19th century. Colonial photography was a powerful weapon of the British Empire, and the images that resulted from these enterprising photographers constitute an important field in photographic history. This colonial vision has bled through time and endures today 
through such structures of hegemonic control as advertising, popular culture, and mass media. Colonial photography remains an important field of study because we're better able to understand the colonial mission through closely examining these early images. John Thompson was employed by the Royal Geographical Society in 1886 as official instructor in photography. Thompson traveled throughout Asia taking photographs of picturesque landscapes and types and categories of Chinese people. As British sought to expand, as Britain sought to expand its empire beyond Hong Kong, Thompson collected thousands of photographs that he compiled into a massive archive titled Illustrations of China and Its People. He conducts an investigation of city dwellers, their occupations, daily routines, living conditions, cultural habits, and families as he follows them along their occupational and domestic performances. These photographs form some of the earliest examples of street photography begun before the invention of artificial flash. So yeah, we can talk about this later, but there's a lot to unpack here. Um, those of you who study British history will know the Royal Geographical Society where Thompson worked as lead photographer um, was a very conservative uh, Tory club. Um, the Geographical Society was where all of the Tory gentlemen met to talk about and uh, plan British expansion. And at this time, expansion was mostly focused on China. So as the British had maintained their, got a small foothold into Hong Kong, the idea was to eventually move inland into China and you know China was supposed to be the new India for the for the empire didn't turn out that way but um, that was the plan at this time so after 10 years of traveling throughout Asia Thompson returned home to London where he set out to capture London's poor in South and East Ends. The, result, the resulting photo book, Street Life in London from 1877, turns Thompson's colonial lens onto his own British people with remarkably similar results. In Street Life in London, Thompson's focus is London's destitute, whom he classifies according to profession or lack thereof. For Thompson, the London poor was the new Asian savage. Thompson seeks out characters and types in the streets to, to supply the bourgeois viewer a better comprehension, as well as a bit of entertainment of the poor Londoner. Thompson addresses his st street dwelling subjects in the same manner he addressed the Chinese in his earlier colonial work, with a keen investigative and critical eye devoid of humanizing or connection. There exists a natural association between Thompson's The Street Temperance from Street Life in London and Parr's Ice Cream Girl from The Last Resort. The two mirror one another in their composition, style, and execution. Both are documentary street photography focused on England's working poor. Both subjects' bodies are angled with the left arm crooked at the hip. They wear black pants and shirts opened with a pale unbuttoned overshirt, both figures' heads are turned toward the photographer with their right hand resting on their workstation or in instruments. Most importantly, the subject of both of these photographs is not the individual, but the class to which they belong and the lifestyle that accompanies it. Both images present us with the physical and emotional burden that accompanies ours weeks, months, and years of physical labor. In a moment of trespassing, both photographers capture a type of working class English. 
In another Thompson Parr comparison, we see a couple of young working class families seen from the perspective of the documentary street photographer. On the left, Thompson's Hookie Alf is an example of the photographer's happy-go-lucky characterization of the working poor in London and shares a likeness with Parr's image of the Liverpudlian Madonna. Both of these images are captured in bright, outdoor, common, crowded areas that deliver English family social life. The subject of both images is not the new mother, but the poverty that she is ensconced in. In both images, the women carefully attend to their children. However, the forces of poverty and the women's economic condition predetermine the life of the child. So then we go on to Thompson and his still life. A further inheritance is noted in Thompson's limited work in still life photography in Asia. Thompson produced only four still life photographs that we are aware of and that still exist, and they have garnered little scholarship. The origins of still life are rooted in Northern Europe in the global networks, trade and resources that accompanied European colonial expansion. A close examination of Thompson's still life, the fruits of China, can help us better understand Britain's colonial objectives. The subject of Thompson's photograph is not exotic fruit, but colonial possession. And in this way, Thompson is seen colonially as he invites his viewers, most likely British members of the Royal Geographical Society, to do so as well. The composition is a traditional Dutch configuration so that regardless of the exotic items, the photograph can be easily read by a European eye. The overall composition spills downward from right to left with all the elements pouring out, opening up, inviting the viewer into the image to partake in this feast of exotic luxuries. At the right, a pomegranate and lychee are peeled, open, and displayed. Even the seeds are splayed and ready for consumption. Thompson visually shows how a resourceful, abundant China is open and ready for the British Empire to conquer and take the spoils of the land. This image is an advertisement to British colonialists back home that the land of China and its resources are ready for the taking. Incidentally, I, um, I had a little over a year ago applied for a grant to go to London to see the welcome collection where all of Thompson's archive is collected now. And of course the pandemic happened and all travel was shut down. So at that time I was not able to uh, get to go to London, but there are only a few still lives of John Thompson. And there is, from what I have seen so far, no scholarship at all on them. So this is part of my project is that I'm illuminating this about PAR and doing the first post-colonial reading on PAR, but also in the same paper, I will be uh, looking at the first scholarly, um, you know, taking apart of Thompson's still lifes, which I don't know, this may be two papers, but I'm gonna put them in one. <laughs> <laughs> Over 100 years after Thompson's still life delivered the advertisement of Britain's colonial ambitions, Parr still life images in seven colonial still lives convey the indelible results of those ambitions. Parr still life Colombo 2004 inspects that most awful of confections, fruitcake. Thompson's fruits of empire have become dried up, nutritionless, sugary nuggets, overly preserved to a point of crystallized petrification. In a saturated kaleidoscopic glow, Parr delivers an advertising-esque image of advertisements. The Royal brand is of singular interest, whose logo includes the British flag, always the most direct of signals. The bright colors of fruitcake are false neon green cherries 
and neon red pineapple are not found in nature. Fruitcake is the ultimate food joke. Much like the empire itself, fruitcake lives past its prime, while in obvious states of decay and is constructed to refuse submission. No one likes it, yet it proliferates. Much like the Commonwealth, fruitcake is food that is infused, influx, translated, hybridized, and because it insists on convoluting the boundaries of food, it is by definition abject. Much like the empire itself, fruitcake persists mostly for a bygone generation that relates to it only through nostalgia. Both Thompson and Parr's photographs investigate the resources of Asia and how those resources relate to Britain's colonial past, present, and future. Thompson's exotic fruit and wine in Hong Kong is reimagined in a postmodern form by Parr's meta imagery of fruitcake and tea in Sri Lanka. Both artists are seen colonially yet in vastly different terms. Thompson is looking towards the future, one gleeful with imperial triumph, while Parr is looking to the past, one rotting in imperial decay. So in conclusion, bringing us into the present moment, um, through establishing a network between Parr, Thompson, and Stuart Hall, who I didn't mention here, but we can talk about, we are able to settle a fixed lineage to an other, a site of contention in Parr's work for decades. In earlier works from The Last Resort, Parr continues Thompson's legacy of class colonization of his own British people, an inheritance that Parr, that Hall, that Stuart Hall warns us we must be aware of in our surrounding mass media. This continued colonial lens carries with it an accompanying visual, psychological, and social oppression with intrinsic propagandistic messages, normalizing racism, classism, and sexism. Only recently last year, Parr was again a participant in this ongoing legacy when he released a new edition of the Italian photographer Gian Buterini's seminal documentary photo book, London from 1969. The re-release was protested by a group of local students who identified blatant racism in a juxtaposition of two side-by-side -side photographs of a black woman and a gorilla in the London Zoo. Parr's images remain popular with the British public who view them as a laugh at English foibles and anxieties, which they are, of course. The images have also maintained a formidable space in the art market and galleries, and the photographs continue to sell well and his prices continue to rise. Currently, art historians are beginning to plant their feet, their feet in Parr's imagery and discover depths and nuances that eludicate his presence in British documentary photography. All of this combines to inform us of the images ability to successfully operate on several levels of meaning. Cute and kitschy photographs make us laugh, feel good, and they sell, but combine that with the inevitable legacy of othering that covertly persists in many of these images and they must be taken more seriously. This makes it all the more important that Parr take responsibility for the colonial photographic legacy in which he has placed himself the original othering criticism from the last resort was over 35 years ago, and Parr continues to not recognize his imagery. In our current era of deep reckoning with white centrism, for Parr to directly engage with colonial photography and its theoretical origins comes a responsibility to perform from a place of informed practice and historical and contemporary social consciousness. Very this is very, very, very interesting. Um, the pictures you chose and the way, how you link them together and this concept of othering in the context of post-colonial uh, photography. And 
I was very, very interested in the topic and I, I'm assuming everyone else also. It's a very <laughs> interesting topic and uh, I'm opening the floor for any questions that anyone might, ha might have about this. If you have any questions, you can ask. Um, Okay, thank, yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kimi, for uh, this wonderful and um, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, actually, um, the way you link literature and photography together and uh, the history of uh, America and uh, colonization and uh, stuff like that, um, it's very, very actually interesting. Uh, I like it very much. Um, um, and especially this last part of African-American people, uh, my PhD actually on uh, African-American literature. Uh, so um, uh, it's very interesting, um, uh, especially this last uh, one, uh, it's in front of us now. Um, um, it's very interesting. Uh, when you first uh, begin your presentation, I kept thinking about what it will be the link between uh, this Martin Barr as a British photographer and a literature. And then when you end it, I got <laughs> the connection actually, <laughs> uh, because uh, it's really a hit a point. Yani, it, actually, it's, 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 yani, it's amazing. Uh, thank you very much for the topic and for your handling of uh, the presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I love the fact that you're studying African American literature. Um, this is, you know, yeah. like I said, yeah. I was an, initially did my undergrad a long time ago, and African American literature at that time was, you know, very much a subset of American literature. At that time, we were still looking at the American classics of Faulkner and, you know, all of this, and you would have, you know, maybe a day where you looked at Toni Morrison yes. or, or even maybe bell hooks a little bit, but it was very much in the mm -hmm. margins and on the yes. side. And I have been since returning to school, I have been fascinated and very happy that this has become more centralized that we are you know I mean years ago we were trying to pick apart the canon and say well what is the canon and who makes the canon and who belongs in the canon and who and, and where do these um where do these ideas begin of who controls the canon and today the fact that african-american literature is so centralized is just um just makes me happy beyond belief. It, it's, it's it's great to see it all over the world, you know, not in, I, I, honestly, I think that I have found that, that other nations are more interested in this than mm -hmm. Americans. Are. <laughs> Actually, and I, and I have been uh, uh, working uh, yani either American literature, because this is my major, um, uh, mainly American literature. So my MA was in American literature and Willa Kather. Uh, and then my PhD is African American, and uh, uh, concerning uh, my um, research papers uh, for associate professor, like it mingles uh, between the minorities. Um, uh, so I read a lot. I actually have been, yani I I lived. I used to live in the states for four years uh, when my husband was taking his PhD. So and I know, yes, I I, I have a first hand contact with uh, the American culture and life there. Uh, um, uh, actually, it's in, in general, it's rich uh, literature. You can delve deeply into it, and you'll got uh, many, many uh, interesting um, points and subjects uh, to deal with. Um, thank you so much for bringing us today to this lovely world. And uh, I think um, it's very impressive uh, uh, to link between uh, photography and uh, literature. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's just, um, you know, when we're studying the humanities, it's just another medium in which we're able to tell a narrative. Yes. You know, you get, there's so many different ways of understanding. And 
for me, studying post-colonial literature and post-colonial theory, I'm able to understand these um, concepts by way of photography, but I just as much use literature. And I mean, I just as much use television, right? Uh, movies, TV, soap operas, whatever you call them. Um, you know, Stuart yes. Hall tells us that these different, um, you know, lower arts such as pop music and um, soap operas, television programs are just as important for us and how we understand what we're studying and how we understand our culture around us. And I, I get a lot of really great ideas and understanding of post-colonial era, the 19th century, I, I'm able to understand better by watching these television programs. And I mean, they would be called soap operas, but they're, they're very informative. And I think that for us to use every medium that we have available to us to do whatever we can to understand, you know, the, the different mediums are just going to bring you a different lens and a different vision to get where you need to go. Thank you very much for the question, Dr. Lehman. Thank you for the answer, Kami. Uh, we have a couple of questions. We have Dr. Nago Suleiman, uh, her hand is up. So Dr. Nago, you can go ahead with your question. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I first like to uh, thank Kami uh, for such a, uh, uh, an interesting uh, webinar and I was just uh, would like you to uh, elaborate a bit about the last uh, picture that uh, was posted uh, in relation to uh, the sense of uh, otherness so uh, in the picture uh, is it because the otherness is because of the um, different ethnicity that the, 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 the person in the picture belongs to and the the cage, uh, the picture of the cage, uh, could it be that the, um, the different ethnicity of this person is uh, um, trapping him uh, uh, or her in this cage? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, actually, it would, it would help if we could see the book in its entirety. I have I have seen this photo book and it was originally published in 1969 by this Italian Gian Bottarini. And if you can see the entire photo book, it's easier to understand. What happens throughout the book is you have these two pages side by side, right? And the images on both sides speak to each other. So on, you know, one image, you'll have a happy child and then a puppy dog, and then you'll have, um, you know, a domestic housewife and you'll have the home. So the, the idea is that the images are on both pages and the images talk to each other. So as you're leafing through this book, it's quite shocking when you you, 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 your mind already knows that the two images are talking to each other. And then you open this page and you have this woman who is clearly, you know, probably coming from work or at work and she's tired and she is the only African-American presence or, uh, well, she'd be African-British presence in the photo book. And the other side is the gorilla in a zoo. And then you think about, you know, I mean, if we want to really unpack it, we can go into the othering gaze of, you know, the colonial trope of being able to stare mm -hmm. that, um, you know, this permission to stare at animals in the zoo and how, many other populations have, you know, said that with racializing people, it's kind of like this feeling of being in a zoo where you're just, you're able to be stared at. 
And also photography as a medium is the still image and the still image gives you permission to stare. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is, uh, if you could see the book in its entirety, it would give you a better understanding that uh, it, it is definitely about her race and the comparison between her race and a caged animal. Um, uh -huh. And I understand that, you know, this was of its time in 69. However, you know, this is Gian Buccherini's particular point of view. This is not Martin Parr's point of view, right? However, Martin Parr um, purposefully re-releases this book later and says, well, I, you know, I'm not gonna edit the book because this is not my viewpoint. This is Gian Buccherini's viewpoint. I'm not, I, ha I have no power to edit this book. However, the fact that this is in the book and it is published, Martin Parr did write an introduction to the re-release. It's, um, it's, it's just, it's transgressive. And especially in 2017, when this was released, uh, it's just problematic. And the fact that he's not recognizing this sort of imagery and addressing it, or just simply saying, why not re-release a different book? You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's just a lot of things to unpack there. And I think it's the fact that he just didn't recognize it, that he wasn't able to see it for what it is. That's that's the point that I'm making. That's just my theory, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kami. Thank you. Oh uh, we have a question from Roa. She's a student in our department. Uh, she's thanking you very much for this extremely interesting talk. And her question is, um, how far do you think the, exhaust the exoticism of colonial subjects influenced these photog photographers in the perspectives they chose for their photographs? That is, was it only power imbalance and struggle or did viewing the other as, ex as exotic play a role in their perspective? Um, let's see, do you mean the, the colonial photographs of, do you mean the Martin Parr photographs or the colonial photographs? I believe she might be talking about both because she did mention um, like exotic um, view of, uh, of the colonial subjects and lower classes as well. So I think she's talking about both. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, certainly, um, I mean, certainly in the 19th century, the exoticism was a, a big part of it all. I mean, and that's kind of the, the, stand that I'm taking with John Thompson's still life, mm -hmm. uh, which is new, which is what like no one else is doing that, right? So I'm I'm gonna examine his still lives and say that this is this is exactly what he was doing is he was saying China is the land of the exotic, mm -hmm. the exotic other um, and that that, I, yeah, part it is that exoticism that makes it so appealing, mm -hmm. you know, to the the white British gaze. It's this otherness, and it's and that's part of Orientalism is that you've got this strange kind of push pull with the other. You've got this um, kind of like dreaded wanting to create a distance, a fear, but also this intense attraction that mm -hmm. Saeed talks about. And it is, it's definitely there with the 19th century. Um, you know, it was a fashion, it was a fashion in 19th century Britain to um, literally a fashion and that, you know, women were adorning themselves in these outfits and um people were putting these products from the east in their homes so it was in the domestic sphere 
they they wanted these images. I mean, there's a reason that Thompson is taking photographs of still life. He's he's using it as an advertisement, yes, but also people wanted these kind of images to put in their homes. Um, yeah. This these exotic things. But then, of course, with Parr, what he's doing is same but different. The exoticism is the class othering, which. I mean, theoretically, we take back to the beginnings of being um, Antonio Gramsci, who the Italian uh, Marxist who is um, who wrote the prison notebooks on, you know, again, fascist about how, you know, working class people should also be intellectuals that we should give working class people the opportunities to be intellectuals. And, um, you know, Gramsci saying that there is a class othering as well. So I think, I mean, I don't think Parr is aware of Gramsci's work. I'm just saying that he's instinctively working in this vein of exoticizing the lower working classes because they're so different than what he is used to as the middle-class Southerner coming from, you know, the South in that time was affluent and the North, you know, it's kind of hard for us to understand now, but um, the the North at that time was the post-industrial North. Mm -hmm. And it was an area, an area of England that was in flux. It just did not know what was going to happen to it. And there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of unemployment. And then Thatcher comes along and it just gets a lot worse. Mm -hmm. So it was a very struggling moment in English history. And, you know, Parr comes up there with his camera and starts taking photos of these people having a good time lying around piles of trash. Mm -hmm. And so it it was definitely an exoticism. Um, And I think that that might not have been a conscious, it's not something that Parr would consciously have been aware of or have said, Mm -hmm. but instinctively, I think he knew that. It was part of the discourse that he belonged to in a way, so he didn't really recognize he was doing this, but he was actually doing it. Maybe this is why he didn't really like opt for saying yes when you interviewed him about this. Because this is why he was probably not open to admitting that. Because yeah, Roy is saying thank you very much. This is really fascinating. Thank you so much for the answer. Uh, Hoda has a question. I think go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Noah, and thank you so much, Kemi, for such an interesting talk. I always like it when you talk about Martin Parr. Um, actually, like there is something that drew my attention, the idea of the commercialization of the other, like how both of them are commercial kind of, or how he is a commercial photographer. And then you, I guess he said that um, uh, Thompson, when he returned to England, he was also a commercial photographer. So the idea of commercializing the other, if you can just comment on this, if you worked on it or or not, just... I'm willing to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Well, that's fascinating. That's a good question. Thanks, Hoda. Um, Yeah. The commercializing of the other. I mean, (laughs) anytime, you know, I hear about this, like this makes me think of, and this is the Americanness in me, right? Is that I, everything comes back to capitalism. And not just capitalism, but this hyper capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I know that that kind of sets me apart from the British lens because there's not quite that sense of hyper capitalism in Britain as there is in America. But um, Thompson was definitely a commercial photographer. He actually set out with Street Life in London what was happening in the 19th century, what was happening at that time was sort of um, a lot of social reforms were going on because, I mean, 
we can put our heads back into, you know, Victorian England. And there was a lot of poverty. There were a lot of people living on the street. And there were the bourgeois classes who wanted to be part of the social reform. So many times what they would do is they would, um, you know, these early photojournalists, they weren't even called that then, but these early, early photojournalists would go out and take photos accompanied with text to show how our society is falling apart, we're disintegrating, we need, these people need help. So there were certain books that photo books along with text that were proliferated in the hopes of raising money to put back into these communities and to help. And uh, Thompson in Street Life in London was part of that. So part of his project that he was doing with Alphonse Smith was to raise money to help these particular people in in this class right so it was it was this act of raising money which is you know commerce but the idea was to reform and to put it back into the community which they did and there's a big history of this in documentary photography in you know the turn of the 19th century america there was the big social reform of taking photos and um, I don't think there was he has never in anything I've ever read mentioned any sort of you know social awareness mm -hmm. um, Parr was trained in the techniques of advertising. So he is using the visual language of advertising, certainly with the bright colors and the, the intense flash that creates an even like an absurdly bright color. Um, Parr himself is highly successful as a photographer, like I said in the paper, his prices are rising. He is starting to get his foothold in art history. Um, the art historians are starting to take him a little bit more seriously, I think. And he is, he's definitely lucrative. Um, and he is clearly, you know, out to make money for himself. No, I mean, no judgment on that. I believe it's important for artists to make money, but yeah, he's, he's been quite lucrative for himself and for Thompson that was as well. So I think that, yeah, I think you're right. I think there is on both sides, a level of consumption, consumerism that drives them definitely with par. And it, yeah, it's the using of the subject um, whatever means possible. And also, I mean, Parr has said many times, he said, well, criticism has only worked for me. And, uh, it's, you know, the, the critics just bring him more and more attention. So I think that, yeah, he, he knows what he's doing. And he just, it's just part of his personality, I think, that he's this sort of curmudgeon, critic, critical kind of just, just has that critical lens and it works for him. And I think he's just gonna continue with whatever works for him. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. Do you have any other questions, Huda? Uh, I always, <laughs> I always do. <laughs> Sorry, Huda. Uh, I'm sorry again if I'm taking too much time this time, but um, Tammy, thank you for the answer and everything. But I'm I'm very much interested in the very first photo that you showed us. Yeah, uh, I guess it was the teacher. Oh, okay. No, you wanted to ask a question about this. Feel free. No, no, go ahead. I have another question, but you know it was related to this. So go ahead. Yeah, it's this very first photo that you said it is um, a tea tray, right? 
Yeah. So this is England. This is this one is in England. Uh, this is in Kandy in central Sri Lanka. Okay. And it's still like, I mean, he found it there and this is where he took the photo of it. Yeah. So this the whole idea behind seven colonial still lives, they were all taken in Sri Lanka. And I mean, it's just, it's seven images. It's super short, little photo books about this big. Okay. And there are a series of three. There's seven colonial still lives, seven communist still lives, which is another type of uh, colonization, right? When you're thinking about Soviet um, mm -hmm. colonialism of that entire area. Yeah. And then seven cups of tea, which is different because there's no real ideology there. But um, yeah, this series, Seven Colonial Still Lives, all in Sri Lanka. And yeah, I, yeah, now that we're talking about it, I wish I could show the other images, but. <laughs> yes, so my question was basically like, this is something that, I mean, the tray itself, maybe like 40, 50, 100 years old or something, right? Yeah. Although you interpreted it, or you have seen it as a kind of decaying uh, colonialism, why can't you say that it in, it's enduring colonialism, like it still persists until now? Yes, that is ultimately, it is what I'm saying with this um, and with the image of fruitcake, you know? So I think like you, you heard what I had to say about the fruitcake, right? So like my fruitcake is the, ultimate metaphor for the colonial project is that it is like fruitcake is meant to endure. There are some fruitcakes that are alive, they, they stay edible for a hundred years. You know, they're just preserved to the point of ridiculousness and everybody nobody wants a fruitcake, nobody actually likes it, and yet they persist, and it's, nobody really knows what it is, so this is like, this is, that's my favorite part of the paper, actually, is like the fruitcake metaphor, and yes, I see that in this as well, is that you have this decaying material, and yet it's, it's still there, right, it still persists, it's still readable and it is, it is, it's this constant um, struggle. It's a struggle between falling apart and trying to remain relevant. It's the struggle of having to reach this acceptance that it is no longer what it was and yet trying to remain viable. So that's what I see with Parr saying about empire. And I think that this is one of the reasons that this is an important image, especially to begin with, because it sets the tone for the others. As I go into you know, talking about what I'm gonna talk about, this just sets the tone. And, and it is that, that you can feel time, you can feel the decay, you can feel that this is something that is not what it once was, mm -hmm. but yet nobody threw it away. It's still there. Why not chunk it in the trash? It's just, it is, there's something that is, making it hang on and that is keeping it in existence and par is going to take a photograph to preserve that hmm. okay thank, thank you. you so much cami thank you so much i have a couple of questions if this is okay um now when i was looking at the images um of martin par before we actually started this uh, webinar I had this idea that there's some sort of a reverse colonial days in a way, um, because when I looked at John Thompson and then I looked at Martin Parr, it felt like Martin Parr was in fact mirroring in a way uh, John Thompson, but like he turned the, the colonial gaze in a way inward. 
as if he was trying to perhaps show how this empire has always been and has actually persisted to be in the present, not as glamorous as you might think. It's a discourse. This is all part of a discourse. So do you have any idea, like anything you can um, comment on in this? Do you see that? Do you don't see that? Because I, I actually felt like he was, in a way, um, trying to show the reality of the empire for what it is through these images that did mirror John Thompson just in a very, I don't want to say like the meaning, but in a way I it must have felt the meaning to the public, you know? So what do you think of that? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and, you know, Parr has said as much. Uh, I, the thing that I, one of the points I want to make in the paper is that and I, I, I tried, <laughs> is that when, when you put this colonial gaze onto people, onto individuals, which is what Thompson did, which is what Parr has done, uh, which is the legacy, right? When you put it onto people, into human beings, it's highly problematic. It's, it's transgressive. It is, um, especially with photography, like I said, it's, it, photography enables you to stare and it's, it's, um, it's just, a, it, it's, it's inherently a transgression. When you do this with individuals and with people, it, it's, um, you, you get this terrible result. But with Parr, when he takes that othering gaze, that othering lens and puts it onto the empire, it becomes much more interesting. And I think he has put this othering lens onto the empire. And he himself says that he's got kind of this mixed relationship with being British, that it's, it's who he is and he loves it. And yet on the other hand, he's constantly questioning it and questioning the British presence around the globe. He travels a lot, uh, used to travel a lot. He's been all over the world and um, everywhere he goes, he's looking for that British presence, mm -hmm. that British presence that is no longer there, but that was once there. And he's constantly looking at it and critiquing it. And I think that when he puts that othering lens onto the empire, it's just much more successful. Because when you put that othering lens onto people, it's not as pleasant. <laughs> um, I, I have a, like, it's more like a comment or a remark on the image that you have here, the one with Kay, with pictures of the queen and, the, and her husband. Now, I was thinking when I saw this, and when you said that this is a tray, I thought of uh, Walter Benjamin, in a way, he was talking about uh, mass production of what iconic or yeah, how he demystifies, demystifies uh, mass production does mystify whatever we might see as iconic or untouchable and so on. And when I saw the tray, I kept thinking to myself, how did it get there? Like, how did it get on a tray in Sri Lanka? Because in a way, I get the point that it might be a symbol of a decaying empire. It might be a symbol of a persisting empire. But for me, it's a symbol of a de demystified empire. It's on a tray where you serve food. And it's obviously something you use in day to day. It's not hung on a wall. It's not in a museum. It's not somewhere where you would expect. Um, you know, Sri Lanka was part of the empire. So what do you have to say about this? What do you think? Oh, I love that. The demystified empire, like a, like Walter Benjamin saying, I love that. Good job. I mean, it's like Walter Benjamin saying, okay, we're just going to take this and we're going to reproduce and we're going to reproduce mm -hmm. and reproduce so much until the aura is gone. Is gone. Mm -hmm. And then what are you left with? You're left with um, these smiling people on a tea tray. So mm -hmm. you've taken away the power. You, like you said, it's, it's not a portrait in a museum. It's a decaying tea tray that is being used to, for these quotidian 
practices, these domestic practices, and their faces are being covered with sandwiches and tea. Mm. And yeah, that's a really good point. I like that, that the power and the enigma and mm. the, the aura and the presence has essentially been removed. Yeah. You know, great. in a way, actually, the mass production is in a way with, which is kind of ironic. It keeps the empire alive because mass producing literally makes whatever it is that's iconic, it filters into the everyday life and the common objects and so on. So it makes it in a way it's very, this is a very, very interesting image. I have to say this by far is the, like for me, the most complicated one in meaning. So uh, yeah, thank you for choosing that. It's, it's great. <laughs> well, good. I, I hadn't realized this one was so popular, but I, but you're right. I mean, I guess instinct. So this is the one that I have spent the most time on, but I think that yeah, you, you, both of you are right. This is one that is really intriguing because, I mean, it's literally the face of empire, right? It's yes. literally the, the visage of, you know, what stands for um, hundreds and hundreds of years of colonial rule. Mm, absolutely. And I, I have one, one final question, but I think you sort of um, touched on it. But why do you think he was very reluctant in admitting that he was actually part of a discourse or part of this othering process or this marrying process? Because you said at the very beginning when you interviewed him, he was very reluctant to admit anything. He just said, you know, don't criticize me. I'm just, why do you think he was reluctant in that? Was he oblivious of it or was he aware and didn't want to acknowledge it? Oh yeah, that is something that I think about a lot. Um, no, he's not oblivious. He acts oblivious. Um, I think this is just his stick. You know, this is what he does is he wants to give a lot of interviews and he wants to talk to a lot of people because he wants to get his name out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you were talking about Hoda with, with, you know, the commodity, he's, he's a very lucrative photographer he's very popular in England he's very popular in Europe the French love him because he critiques the English so of course the French love him um he's lesser known in America but very popular in Europe I think that early on in the 1980s when he did the first color series the last resort he got so much criticism and, you know, like I said, it's hard for us to see those images now as being as ugly as they were and they were perceived in the 1980s because we've got so much worse now, you know, it's just the evolution of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but to put our heads in the 1980s, they were very shocking. And he got so much criticism then that, um, you know, and he'll mean younger, he was, I don't think he was quite prepared. He wasn't famous at that time. He was younger. I don't think he was prepared for the onslaught of criticism that he had gotten. Mm -hmm. And I think that his reaction was defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking that criticism and saying, okay, let's unpack that. And what am I doing? And why am I doing it? Perhaps he did that. I mean, he obviously, he has evolved. Um, but I think it was just that initial criticism was so ugly that he just maintains this defensiveness. And mm -hmm. he and his supporters both, they well, they all, they, there's this kind of this school of par supporters say, oh, it has nothing to do with him. It's because the color. They blame color. The color was so bright and it was so acerbic <laughs> that it's, it's the color that you're angry at. You're not angry at the photographer. Oh, and then they would say humor. Oh, it's because there's humor in the pictures that, you know, it, it humors blame. And it was kind of like this whole school of 
blame anything except for the photographer, Mm -hmm. which I think anybody who works in photography knows that um, you, you, there's no such thing as an objective image. True. I hope there was just saying there's no bad publicity. So I think he was after publicity, whether with criticism or with praise. So thank you so much for this amazing and fascinating um, presentation and paper. Um, I'd love to read the paper at one point, uh, if it's uh, possible at any point when it's published. So thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I have one more question. Okay, go on. Sorry, I'm sorry. 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 Um, can we have a question? Um, did Martin Parr do anything like any photography on Brexit? Ah, oh, Hoda, you are the best. Look at it. Okay, so very, I, I, I have some extra things here at the end, you know, just little stuff. So this is Empire. Um, and then, of course, uh, Ceylon here, which is Sri Lanka, Commonwealth some books that I like. (laughs) Uh, Hoda, do you remember when we were in IWL and um, Vin Katmani mentioned this book, Passport Photos? Yes. I just bought it on Amazon. So I have it. I haven't read it yet, but it is kind of this, um, another intersectionality with, you know, post-colonial novel and photography. So if anyone is interested in this area, I, I actually have the hard copy with me and I'm going to dig into that soon once the semester's over. <laughs> and here is an image that Parr took. He did a short series during the time of Brexit. And um, I'm so glad you mentioned this because this is actually where I first encountered Martin Parr was you know I was starting graduate school this was you know in our in our pre-pandemic times and it was the time of Brexit and I was just you know as an Anglophile I was fascinated with what was happening watching watching Britain and England do the things that it was doing during this time and um yeah I know it it was it was a time of real political uncertainty for all of us and you know this rise of English nationalism that was occurring this English separatism um you know returning England wanting to return to the small island at the end of the world that it saw as its former glory So Martin Parr, being the documentarian that he is, set out to go uh, up north where there's a much more conservative area that was interested in, um, that was interested in Brexit and the removal from the EU. So they were, they, up north, they were not the remainers, they were the Brexiteers. So Martin Parr goes up north, and this particular image was from a St. George's Day parade, and um, St. George being the the patron saint of England. And this is, I think this is a fascinating image. And this is one of the things that is tricky about Parr, and I think... You know, he claims that he is neutral, but he's not. But I think this is one of the tricky things about him is that he's able to walk this fine line. He's able to court both sides, I think, because with this image, you know, if you are a remainer, then I think you can see a critical lens Mm -hmm. in this image. But if you're a Brexiteer, I think that you can also take this image on your side. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I think that part of what makes Parr commercially successful is that he's able to walk this fine line between 
both sides of the aisle and both sides could claim him as their own. And I, as um, someone who was hoping for um, Britain to stay in the EU, I, you know, I can see this in a critical way if I wanted. I see, see here is the mother and her two daughters. And you see this, I mean, the face painting is, is very profound. You know, the fact that she has England written on her face. But you see, the way I read this image is that, you know, mother says, we're going to remain. And you can tell that this is mother and daughter because they look exactly alike. And what this is to me is, this is the lineage. This is how these ideas are passed down mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, they have this stern look on their faces that this child is taking this very seriously, that England remains England. We are who we are. It's, um, it's pretty scary when you think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the, you see these ideologies passed on from generation to generation. And um, I think this image shows how important Brexit was for, for um, many people who were going through that at the time. I mean, it's, it's been, I mean, that was years of just terrible struggle and debate so yeah, he's been he's been very um, forward with his ideas. So actually, Parr himself was a Remainer, oh. and yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is very interesting. <laughs> at all, so yeah, this is very interesting. I would have taken him for a Brexit uh, supporter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too yeah me too but he's um I mean you know to talk about him personally he's in some ways he can be quite open-minded I know that he has a daughter who is gay and he's very supportive of his daughter so in some ways he can be quite open-minded um I do not think that Parr is racist by any means. I don't think he is. I, I just think that he is um, very reluctant and very stubborn and very defensive. And I think that that is what has held him back more than anything is this kind of stubborn reluctantness to face his critics. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank you so much. So um, with this, we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Cami, for the lovely talk and for answering all our questions. Thank you so much, Dr. No, for moderating the, the webinar and looking forward to our coming webinars. Um, and Cami, please, whenever you publish the paper, you have an audience here who would like to read it. Please, yes, absolutely. You guys, both of you, you've all been so wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanafi and Hoda. Uh, I mean, you guys are just wonderful with your fantastic you. comments and questions. And yeah, I will definitely keep you posted. And I hope I get to see you in person one day. We're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for all our attendees. Um, see you soon, inshallah, in another webinar. And thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.